All right, here we are, Mindset Squared. Mike, good welcome. to have you back. Welcome back. We got a couple of great um, guests today, the, the Tate Brothers, as, as they're known or as they're called. Yeah, so uh, why don't we start with uh, Tristan. T- introduce yourself. Uh, Tristan Tate. Um, I'm a the brother of Andrew Tate, of course, professional kickboxer. Uh, I work, I guess, in the adult entertainment industry uh, in Bucharest, Romania. Um, I've been a friend of, of Mike and Mike here for the last uh, year or so. Um, Mike's first international trip, Mike Boland's first international trip, was out to see me in Bucharest very recently. I hope you had a good time, Mike. Secret trip, too. I showed up and surprised Cernovich. He didn't know I was coming. Absolutely. And right? he worked with me on that to, to and, surprise uh, everybody. Yeah, and Andrew, or otherwise known online as Cobra Tate. Is that what I'm known as? I thought I was known as something far worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the worst man on the internet or yeah. something. Yeah. Well, well, Cobra Tate has all the girls. Remember that article? They, they thought they were making fun of you, and it was... Yeah, written, I was like, this is great. It was written in that very snarky kind of media bro style, which is, this guy has all the girls. There are no girls left for anyone thinking he's making fun of you. It was, and I was just retweeting every five seconds. Was, I was like, finally, yeah. the recognition I deserve. It, it was bizarre for your great Star Wars uh, troll. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, okay, so Andrew or Cobra... <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself for those folks that don't know. Because yeah, uh, four-time kickboxing world champion, recently retired, trying to find some excitement in life that can replicate world level combat. So uh, driving super. We found and some money. excitement in Transylvania, didn't we? I think we did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's a kind of cool place to live. I I always say to all the young people who message me, they're like, "Why do you live in Romania?" And I say, "Look, if you're a young guy and you don't have any attachments yet." Why do you live in America? <laughs> that's that's my answer, pretty much. Yeah, like you're this. nicer than I am. I hate questions like those. I don't just don't have the patience for them. Yeah. It's like why are you lose or just living a conventional life that like the default. Yep. You know, it's just I I'm glad you guys have the patience for that because maybe at one point <laughs> time I did. I just don't. <laughs> right? Like you're just living a script that somebody else wrote for you. Yeah. And like, well, why would you live in Romania? Like, what the fuck do you know about Romania? You know nothing. You don't about, know nothing, right? exactly. But you yeah. like, I can't believe anybody would live there. Well, why? You don't know anything about it. So how could you not believe somebody would live there? Well, right. How often I'm do getting people... triggered thinking about that already. Just the <laughs> Calm down, Mike. Calm down. I'm like, I'm gonna, Mike now officially does my DMs. I'm gonna give Mike my DMs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mike's already a little pissed off because there was some traffic coming. That's up not here. what pisses me off, but I'm just uh, you, you think um, the people just live like a very boring conventional life, and then they don't know anything about your life. But then they're almost like questioning like your life. Yeah. Where the the right way to ask the question is, why would I want to live just some boring life? Yeah, absolutely. That, that makes more sense. No, it's absolutely true. Because when I see someone doing something very abstract or something I've never thought of or something very unusual, I think that's that's pretty cool. You know, I don't I don't sit there and go, oh, why? You know, but is like, it safe there? Is Romania safe there? <laughs> uh, are you, aren't you afraid? Uh, it's so dangerous everywhere. Right? You know what's the, the most crazy thing for me is this this American idea of of one that the whole world's dangerous and parts are, but parts are much safer than here. And then also this idea of freedom. And this has been drilled into, I'm not being anti-American in any way, I'm an American citizen, but the idea that America's free and nowhere else is free. I feel more free in Romania than I do here. Well, explain that. In in what way do you, how do you relate freedom to being in Romania? Well, I can can give you a very short example. Yeah, please. About three years ago, I flew my cousin into Romania to see me. Now, he's an American uh, from California. And he got in my car. We were uh, having a few beers. He had a beer in his hand. He got in my car. I said, where should I throw this? Now, I haven't lived in America since I was eight years old. I said, why would you need to put your beer outside of my car? He goes, oh, well, it's an open alcohol container. I said, why can't you, the passenger of my car, drink alcohol while I'm driving? I don't understand. And it really blew my mind. We then got to the mall, and he said, okay, now where, where do I throw this? Right. I said, why? He said, well, I can go in the mall and drink this? I said, well, are you going to get drunk and attack somebody? He said, no. I said, well, keep your beer in the hand and walk to the mall. You know, well, what's the problem? Yeah, I think that, that that's exactly right. I think society can only move as, as fast as the slowest person. That's how groups work. If you have a group of people, you only move as fast as the slowest person. And in some societies where you have all these slow people, you have to make all these super stringent laws to just try and keep society ticking over. So that's a perfect example, the open alcohol container. That's a law made to make sure that even idiots can't make a mistake. Like you have to really cater for the idiots. Whereas in some societies where people are relatively normal, and I don't even think it's an IQ thing. I think it's more of a cultural thing where people are more culturally astute and more relatively normal. You don't need such stringent laws, and, and, and things change. Romania's laws are very, very lax. You have far more laws here than you do there, and it's still a safer society for just the fact that it's a Christian society and people still respect their parents and 
which is a normal place. So here I see all these very stringent laws. Another quick example on the way over here, the Uber driver said he got caught doing 165 miles an hour, which is fast. And he did three months in jail and they crushed his car. I got caught doing 165 miles an hour two weeks ago. And I said, sorry, I gave him 50 bucks. So it's like, wh where's <laughs> free? You know, it's, it's, it's it, to me, I just feel better there. Yeah. yeah. And nowhere is perfect for anywhere. I don't advocate everyone moving to Eastern Europe or to Romania. Different places suit different people. Uh, Napa Valley suits you very well, I know, Mr. <laughs> Boland. Um, yes. But uh, you, so for somebody like me, Bucharest is an amazing city, and I like living there. I don't advocate it for everyone else, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just the, it's the idea that everywhere that's not America is dangerous. That you'd get that in Thailand. I'm like, well, Thailand's safer here. Vietnam, Vietnam. Yeah. Almost everywhere I've been, I've I haven't gone to Colombia and, and other parts, but almost everywhere I've been is actually safer than the U.S. Yeah. Other than you take one kind of bad area, but in America, everybody thinks every other country is like a hellhole or something. Well, this is the thing, because in a lot of these countries, Thailand, Vietnam, even Romania, all of Eastern Europe, the crime is organized. So the, Thailand has mafia. But if you don't mess with the mafia, they're never going to mess with you. So, like, I'd much rather live in a society with an organized crime, with organized crime, meaning that if I run my mouth, I may get in trouble. But there's never going to be a violent, random act of violence. You're never going to be walking down the street and randomly someone, you know, tries to randomly attack you or all these. This is, the, this is kind of like the unique thing about crime in the West. A lot of it's random. It's bad, wrong place, wrong time. Whereas if something bad happens to you in Ukraine, you're probably running your mouth to some dude you shouldn't be running your mouth to. You're, you're very rarely going to go to a cash point and someone just roll up with an AK. It's just not going to happen. So it's know? interesting. It's almost like people say that New York City in the 1940s or 50s in certain areas was run by the Italian mafia, but they kept the crime away from those areas. It was very safe to be in that area. Well, we, we in Romania, we, I mean, we've been there a long time now. We know some very high-level guys, and, and the high-level guys, the mafia guys, so it's like almost like they keep right. it safer than the police can. They go, no, no, right. drugs don't come to my town. Yeah. Well, we have my kids are there. Yeah. So in Bucharest, you don't have a, a drug culture. Super, like you, not, like nothing you like, like the West. Nothing right. like the West. I mean, if you were to really look for it, you might be able to find some shit weed or mm -hmm. something. But you're, there's definitely no heroin. There's no meth. If, if there's coke, you're getting scammed because it's been cut. It's just talcum powder. Like there's no, I mean, if you're going to bother transporting drugs from Colombia to Europe, you're going to stop in London and sell it. You're not going to take the further risk of taking it all the way to the very edge of the EU yeah. where hardly anyone does it. And Romania you know? has a hard border. You have to get it across then another hard border. Right. So, yeah, so there's very little. So how, how does that affect doing business there? It, let's jump out of the illicit activities, but but doing a normal course of business where you're going to open up uh, whatever, uh, some kind of restaurant or something. So, so Romania is absolutely corrupt, but it's a corruption that everyone can participate in. I would much rather live in a country that's corrupt where I get stopped for speeding and I give them a little bit of money than a country that's corrupt like America, which says it isn't corrupt, but you have to be a billionaire and have a private jet and go to islands to get away with it, you know? <laughs> like, if, if you're going to be corrupt, which every nation on earth is, then let everyone play the game. So, like, um, Romania's corrupt. So if you want to open a bar, you need an alcohol license. I mean, if you, take, if you give the guy a tip or a bribe, you'll get the alcohol license the same day. If you don't, it takes six months. That's just and one, that's one of the That's a good point, though. That's a good point about corruption that most people in America don't really understand is they they think it's corrupt that you can bribe a street cop but i think that's better than you have to know like the judge and be able to call a judge like the corruption is completely inaccessible to just the like the average ordinary person and we have way more corruption in america than in the rest of the world of course i mean i'm, I'm not not to not to be anti-western or anything but it's the western countries that are getting caught with all this pedophile stuff and like the really bad stuff it's no, it's no Eastern European politician that's running around doing all this really bad stuff, you know? Well, like, and you have the bad actors, oddly enough, dying in a federal prison. Yeah, well, yeah, it's strange, yeah. strange so, how that happened. Mike right. knows a thing or two about that, don't you, Mr. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think Mike knows everything about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> more, more than I wish. But, it, yeah, and then also, too, you would be, and that's where the culture is different, too, is there... So in the West, one of the weird things about the West is you watch House of Cards, and I thought this too when I got kind of heavily involved in the political world, is one of the great mysteries is like people don't get really murdered, Epstein being an exception, yeah. in the West. But if you were a pedo or something, um, the local politicians would just be taken out yeah. by, by local elements because the, the Christians and organized crime would just say, okay, we can't have pedos. Well, yeah, I mean, this is a, a long story that I'm going to keep short for the, for the point of the broadcast, but there's a monastery near Bucharest I used to visit because it was on a route, a really nice driving road, and I used to stop there, and I used to go there all the time, and I had a Lamborghini, so they were very curious. Anyway, I ended up speaking to the head priest, 
So I'm talking to the head priest. I was talking to him for a while, and then he was talking about leasing me some land, some church land to build something, blah, blah, blah. So I brought my business partner there. Mm-hmm. And at the end of this meeting, my business partner said the church still run countries like Romania because it's 90, 98% of people identify as Christian. Oh, that's an incredible statistic. 98%. Wow. Yeah. The most Christian country in the world. Most Christian in, country in, in the world, way, Romania. In that statistic. So it's Orthodox Christian. So if, they, if, if the Christian or the, if the church endorses a political party, that's it's the, over. That's the winner. <laughs> that's the winner. That's the winner. So they, they still have huge influence there, you know? So um, the only way you're going to get the endorsement of the church, I mean, of course, there's some corruption involved, but a lot of it is about good Christian man, all these kind of things. You can't do, you can't run around and be an asshole and, and, and get foreign politics over there. So a lot of people say, oh, yeah. You know, the politicians there are hard or they're mean or they're far right. Well, they're Christian. They believe in Christianity. And if you truly believe in Christianity, you're going to be a right wing politician. How else are you going to be anything else? You know? Yeah, yeah the, the Polish, one of the high level Polish MPs got into it with um, Major Hassan. I love that guy. Yeah, yeah, Dom- Dominic. And, and, they, and they, yeah. Were just, they were just saying, well, you're, you know, are you anti Muslim or whatever? He's like, no, but we're just Christian. Yeah. Like, I'm not anti anybody, but no, we're just Poland is Christian. And Absolutely. that's just the way it's going to be. It's going to be Christian. And then. The flip side is you never hear people say, well, why why doesn't Saudi Arabia take in Christians? Absolutely. Like they're just they're a Muslim country. Good for them. That's what they want to do. Exactly. It always goes like one way. So Romania is still safe, but they're they're working their way east. So they're trying to really take, you know, make Hungary sort of, you know, something different and they're working on Poland and yep. it'll be interesting to see when they start to try to apply that pressure to Romania. Yeah, and the Romanians um if you ask a Romanian person how it is there, they said, and when they start messing with our religion, they start messing with our money, that's when we throw a revolution. And mm-hmm. that's what the Romanians typically will do. Now, I was driving down a, a very famous street in Romania, and they have flags everywhere. The Romanian flag is everywhere in that country. I'm not sure if you guys noticed. Mm-hmm. And I was driving with a Romanian friend of mine, a business partner. And I said to him, you know, in England, they take these flags down. Because if I call and say, well, I'm Indian, and uh, England, under this flag, committed crimes in India, and I find this flag offensive, mm-hmm. they actually seriously consider it. And then they do take the flags down in some cases. I said, what would happen if I were to call them and say, well, I'm Turkish and we had a war with Romania and this flag offends me in Bucharest. Can you take it down? They said, don't even do that as a joke because they'll find a way of making you leave the country. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'm not doing it. You know, they're very proud of who they are. And yeah, they're, yeah, they're proud of who they are. They're proud of their religion. And, and this is the, the biggest thing about all societies. It's not even about West versus East. As soon as you have a society which half hates itself or doesn't have anything to unify itself under, whether it be a religion or a flag or anything else, you end up with what we have in, in the West, which is just a free for all. How long have the uh, brothers Tate been in Romania? Four, uh, four years, T. Four years now, yeah. Four years. Yeah. Okay. And, and and yeah, I mean, all of Eastern Europe's good, but it's just it's just a good combination for us. And and yeah, it's a really it's a really nice place. I mean, everywhere has its its cons. If you go there and you work a normal job, you're broke. But if you have some money and you're you know you're out there and you're doing your thing, it's a really really pleasant place to live. And you're never gonna have any trouble. So you find it's a good place for young hustlers. Yeah, yes. like a digital nomad kind of thing, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, it's 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 a it's a cool place. For and you have a few of those guys that work for you that that have transitioned there from other countries, and how are they doing? Yeah, so um, yeah, so my my very simple business philosophy is that um, I I don't hire people based on openings I have. I hire people based on who they are and if I like them, and then I find an opening for them. So there's a few guys who I really believed in, and I believed in their work ethic, and I believed in their ambition, and I thought, you know what, I'll hire them. And mm-hmm. then I'll find something for them to do. Living with them now, um, and I'm excellent at finding work to do. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm how good long at that. are they going to last, though? How long are they going to last? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, I mean, so far I'm happy with them. So far they're doing okay. You know, uh, they haven't upset me in any way yet. But uh, yeah, I, I think they'll do all right. Um, I think they'll be around for a while, hopefully. I mean, they seem to like the place, and you know, they're making enough money. So yeah, one thing I found with the quote unquote digital nomads is. A lot of them are just dysfunctional people, and they just can't get any job. Correct. So then they're like, oh, I'll just go work on the internet, not realizing that it's actually harder to do because you have to be an entrepreneur. Yep. You're, you're going to actually work harder. And I, Like I, I lived in uh, Chiang Mai for a little bit and all over, and it would it'd always be funny. I would see these people selling these courses on – how to be a digital nomad, how much money they're making, but like I knew all of them and they were all like broke. Yeah, of course. <laughs> or they were you know, making like 1500 a month or of something course. like that. Yeah, I mean, the, absolutely. And I have one guy who works for me who's exactly like that, who's li- literally semi-dysfunctional, so he's, he's in trouble. But um, no, you're right. And the internet's full of fakers. And the internet's, I, guess, I guess the reason I'm quite successful with my marketing is I've kind of come along and been like, okay, here's proof of everything, mm-hmm. which is quite rare. You know, mm-hmm. like I've really put myself out there. And one of the reasons I can do that is also because I live in Romania. You know, it's amazing to me that, like, in, in the West, doxing's a thing. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I'll tell you my address right now. <laughs> okay. right. Come get me. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's free. like it's kind of cool when you're over there. You're like, no one's gonna dox me. No one's gonna roll up. If they do, I know I've, I I call my friends and they're in big trouble. It's like it's kind of it's kind of cool from that perspective. Well, it's kind of hard to find your place even with an address too. Yeah, what are you gonna do? The yeah. taxi driver's gonna rip you off yeah. on the way there. Box down the road, the GPS quit working. Yeah. 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 Have, then you have to go to the McDonald's gas station and have you guys come pick us up. Exactly. Yeah, that, that happened to someone I know. That yeah. happened, yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of it's kind of cool from that perspective, you know, like just uh, kind of being so far off radar gives me some it gives me some bravery. You know, if I was exactly the same way I am living in America. I'd always be thinking at night, maybe some idiot's going to roll up. He knows i got some money. He knows i got some nice cars. He rolls up with a whatever. You, you don't know, you know? Right. Or even Over a there, creepy it's like, stalker. Like, people like Logan um, Logan Paul and those guys, fans or whatever, they've just found them, like, camping out in the yard outside. Yep. So you could just get straight-up creep people who yep. don't maybe want to kill you necessarily for what you have, but they're just creepy yeah. kind of incels or something like you that. You know what? Like, I would love to, if I ever become king of the world, which maybe might happen, I need to instruct the best scientists in the world, and I'd love to do some kind of study on like culture and on people, and work out why some countries are full of weirdos and some countries just aren't. No, like, and I mean this genuinely. Like the idea of a stalker comping outside your house and and wanting to be you that a that is so American. Like that's right. never going to yeah. happen in Eastern Europe. People are too busy. Yeah. They have to pay the bills. They're busy. Like no one has time for that crap. One of it's the, crazy. One of the examples I can give on this is uh, if you ever do see a homeless pe- uh, person in Romania, every country has homeless people. Uh, Bucharest has far less than Los Angeles, I do have to say. Um, he's an old friendly guy. He's drinking. He says, hey, my friend, I need some money for some more right. beer. I'll give him money. He'll say, oh, thanks. He might sing a song and walk down the road. He's the friendly 1960s style bum that you'll imagine from New York. You know, I was uh, in Los Angeles about a year ago. And uh, a homeless person walked into a Taco Bell restaurant and started harassing the staff. Uh, I kid you not, it was it was a, a gentleman my size, about six foot four, two hundred and twenty pound black man wearing lingerie, stockings, and high heels with razor sharp fingernails. And I thought, that's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Like only in America, uh, I've like, never uh, seen that. Uh, yeah, where, <laughs> why is this place full of crazies? Yeah. Like, well, where, why? It's, I mean, it's, it's empire in decline, just self indulgent. Where the like you notice this in Vietnam too is. The homeless people are quite respectful. Yep. Thailand, the homeless people are quite respectful. Very. And then in America, there's just tolerance went too far to where, oh, we have to feel bad for these homeless people. And then bad actors take advantage of it. Yep. And then because begging has always existed. And even in the Bible and other texts, begging was considered an honorable profession. Like yep. there's nothing you can do. You're missing. You know, there was a guy in, in Vietnam. We would drive by every day, actually, near the house. And he had no arms, and he just had feet, and he would sell lottery tickets by the side of the road. Yep. You're just like, what else is he going to do? That's an yep. honorable thing, right? Yep. But here you have guys like us harassing people, like getting in their faces. They're like intimidating. And then even if you you know, can fight, you're like, well, this guy could have hepatitis, and he's going to claw your face. Yep. And, yep. and nobody, nobody will crack down on that at all because then that would be seen as like, oh, you're intolerant. You don't care about the homeless people and yep. blah, 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 blah. So that's just far wing far left wing um, in action. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that's probably going to get us all in trouble on this podcast, so Uh-oh. I'm sorry. But um, I was, recently I've been in a few countries. I've been in, I was in Belarus and I was in a few other countries and they're all run by dictators and they are so clean. And I'd say to people, like, why is this place, like, in, in Belarus, all around all the sidewalks, they have granite. You know, like granite from the granite marble top if you buy an expensive kitchen table. They have all this beautiful granite everywhere. This is in Minsk. This is a poor country. This is Belarus. And, and I was like, why? And they go, oh, the dictator drove through and he just said he wanted to look better and he just pointed and it got done next day. And I was like, okay, well, obviously under dictatorship, things get done quickly. But the problem <laughs> with dictatorship is that obviously if you're an enemy of the state, you get in trouble. And then I was sitting there thinking, looking at England and some of the things that have happened with Tommy Robinson and stuff. And I was thinking, if you're an enemy of the state in the West, you're in trouble anyway. Right. <laughs> like, what, are we really safe this, and protected? This jumps right back to the Epstein. Like, uh, yeah, are, we really pro- are we really protected Julian by this Assange? democracy and law yeah. and all this garbage? No, like Julian Assange is in some... Um, even in, in the Belmarsh. UK, he, he actually has done his time yep. because they go, oh, we're not holding him for extraditing. We're holding him for this sexual thing or whatever. Complete so lie. That, yeah. yeah, the ultimate lie. me too. And then that the, the sentence for that was over and he's still in there. Therefore, yep. pro- and there's no way to get him out. Yep. And, and you can't even bribe somebody to get him out. So in many ways, it's worse because if you're the enemy of the state here, I mean, Roger Stone's on trial. Yep. They're, they'll come after you with the full weight of the law. And destroy and you just the same. Yeah. So they're like, oh, yeah, because this Belarusian girl, she was like, oh, yeah, but if you upset the president. I was like, look, the West is really not any better. And at least here you can have someone drive through the neighborhood and clean it up in 10 minutes. 
Give me a dictator who will drive through LA and say, you know, that's enough. This, 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 this. Here's a list. I want it done by Monday. Yeah. Like, I, you know, like, let's just get stuff done. Because yeah. you're no safer here than you are there anyway. You upset the government, you're in trouble. Yeah. So I have, I have seen tent cities in two places. Lagos, Nigeria, and Los Angeles, California. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, that's uh, it. I was explaining to a, a, a native of California yesterday, a girl I ran, into, uh, I ran into. I was explaining to her how weird it is to, to see a tent city. She's, oh, well, what do your homeless people live in? Right. I'm like... I don't know, but they're not in tents on the side of the road. Um, a, a good friend of mine, Bobby Dino, who you guys know, was uh, I picked him up from the airport in Bucharest, and we were driving to my house. He says, you know, it's so strange to see nobody living under this overpass, this motorway overpass. I said, why would people be living under a bridge? That's not where people live. People live in houses. They don't live under the bridge. This isn't a fairy tale. And uh, he just found it mind-blowing because he's from the California area, and I just... But all it's of gotten the, worse, too. Like it, It's gotten way worse over the past five or ten years. Where and it's just filth, and, and that goes back to why do they exist? Well, they're not quote unquote real homeless people. Yeah. They're just druggies, and, it, and you can't say that. Like they're just they're druggy. Like you walk down the street, and they walk like in a zombified opioid yeah, yeah, state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're not people. They were born with no arms. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Like yeah. what else? When, you know, what else are they going right. to do? No, it's absolutely true, and I that that's one point. The hard drugs are massive. I mean, anyone who's in the right psychological state of mind could find a job and find a airbnb bed for five bucks a night and work something out the mm -hmm. fact that they end up there it means they, they have some kind of psychological issue and, and people say oh you must feel sorry for them maybe but it's a tough world and we all have to deal with our own problems and if you're going to just shrug all your problems aside and expect society to save you well, I, they, I don't really feel too sorry for you That's they got the, on drugs i mean one of the most poignant moments when i was much younger was i was just walking down the street in san francisco this is before the drugs got really bad 12 years ago maybe yep. 13 years ago and a guy who just you know looked like us respectable guy yep. He was just walking in front of me. All of a sudden, he makes a beeline and almost bumps into me. And I thought that was weird. And he's sitting down. Then he just goes and sits down at Walgreens. And I was like, well, that's weird, you know? Yeah. He doesn't look like a beggar or whatever. And then I was out late. Two months later, I saw the same guy, Big Beard, digging through trash, eating. Yeah. And I thought, I just literally saw that guy's deterioration. Yeah. No. So at the time, there was no opioid thing. It just didn't make sense to me. I didn't yeah. know what was going on. And he realized, yeah, he just went from a normal, respectable guy, druggy. And he was good looking, fit, yep. you know, you name it, and sits down. That's his first day of begging. Now he's digging through the trash. Isn't because this he's a drug user. isn't this all just a breakdown of like of like family? Like I cause when I speak to Romanian people and I explain like in, in, in England now they've got a big problem with, with old people and pensions and they've nowhere to put them and old people home and stuff. And I sit and I think, well, England's putting billions and billions into this. These poor Eastern European countries put zero into this stuff. Because, well, that's your mother. You look after your mother. That's your grandparents. You look after your grandparents. Like, like mm -hmm. the family do so much work that now we've passed over to governments. Like, mm -hmm. if, 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 if if in Eastern Europe, if you tried to be a druggie, your own brothers would kick the shit out of you. Like, what are you doing? This yeah. is our name. You can't be fucking running around breaking well, into houses. Andrew, I think you and I had this conversation when when I was in Romania. Was that there's not a social safety net there? Zero. Right? There's zero. So you, if you're homeless or you're down on your luck or whatever the issue is, you've got two options. It's either church. Yep. That takes you in and helps you yep. if you're a member of the church yep. or it's family. I've, that, that's it. And it's crazy how here we talk about we need more social programs, more social programs. And you're putting in billions and billions of dollars that exceed the entire GDPs of these countries. And they have a fraction of the issues purely because people just go to their family and they say, look, I'm down on my luck. I need to stay with you. And the family's like, yeah, OK, cool. And everyone just gets along and there's no big argument, no big fight. It's just, you know, you have to sleep on the couch. OK. And isn't, this, isn't that normal? Like when I when I first started making money, I retired my mother. I, I called her up and said, look, because she was still a dinner lady. She was washing dishes. And I said, fuck that off. Quit. I'll, I'll triple your money and you stay at home. And when I told people I do that, they go, don't you think it's weird? You have to look after your own. Like she's a grown up. I was like, well, why? I, and they were calling me a weirdo. And I said, isn't that as old as human time? The sons make money to look after the parent. Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? I don't know. I, I, I thought that was normal, and everyone's coming after me. Well, she's a grown-up. Why does she need your help? Well, she's yeah. wasted her life. She has no money. To, and and it, I was, it's just, to me, it was like the Western attitude towards the whole thing was so skewed. In good conscience, if you're a millionaire and your mother's washing plates for 10, 10 pounds an hour, you, you can't yeah, well, yeah, well, Or, like, I'll give you another example. When Serena Williams, remember Serena Williams' sister got shot? Remember that? I remember watching the news. I was sitting there with my girlfriend at the time, and my girlfriend was like, oh, it's so sad. Look how upset she was because Serena, or whichever one, Venus, was crying crying her eyes out and i was like why is her sister still living in compton like are you're gonna be so stingy with your money you're gonna make all that money right. and you're not gonna get bail your entire family your entire every single one who's half related to you out of the worst neighborhood in the world then you're gonna go on tv and cry your eyes out because you saved one hundred and fifty thousand dollars from your 200 million on buying her a half nice house like what's wrong with people
Yeah. It's, just, it's just crazy <laughs> to me. I don't understand it. Yeah. You know. It's the cultural deterioration. And then likewise, too, though, is the reason you don't have a lot of these problems in Eastern Europe is because if you want to be a druggie, they're just not going to accept it. Yeah. Just, you just can't be. But yeah. it's culturally, and this is what people don't really understand, I think, living in a kind of a free-for-all that we live in now is, what do you mean I just can't do it? It's like, you just can't do it. Yeah, well, no no one's going to give you a, well, an ounce of sympathy. Yeah, you would get your ass beat. Your yeah. Peer pressure yeah. would be like, you want, you just you can't you can't do that. You can't live that way. And here they're like, well, I, I can do whatever they want, and yeah. we see where that leads to. And, yeah. the, and the culture and the language very much backs this up. When I, when I read American people talk about the problems of, uh, of addiction, and it is a big problem. It's a serious problem which needs a serious solution. I, Oh well, these people are sick. It's not their fault. Right. Uh, these people have a disease, and uh, that's why they're here. And um, uh, full disclosure, by the way, um, on the point we made earlier, me and Andrew aren't some rich snobs looking down on people. We l used to live in a homeless shelter in England for two years. Our whole family lived in a homeless shelter. We come from a as poor as you can get living in the Western world. Uh, but yeah, the, the, even their the language that they talk. Whereas in it's very in Eastern Europe, I have Polish friends, Slovak friends. Yeah. I do a lot of business over there. They're realistic. Yeah. It's your fault. What are you doing? Why are what you, are you taking drugs? Put the drugs down. <laughs> it's your fault. What are you doing? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the West, the language is just very skewed. Uh, it's nobody's fault. Nobody's responsible. Well, it's society's fault, actually. It, yeah. No, no, I, I, it blows me away because I read a lot of these San Francisco um, tweets where these people. It's gotten so bad now that they'll, ju they'll just break into your house, break into your car. Yep. One night, 165 cars broken in. Wow. And you would think everybody would just be like, okay, this is enough. Yep. But you'll actually see comments to the stories, oh, this is so terrible that people feel like they have to break into a car. Yeah, like and I'm like, okay, if this doesn't <laughs> yeah. make you people up, I don't, I don't yeah. really know what to do with you. You're, you're beyond, yeah, you, you're not yeah. even thinking, oh, it's a shame that they feel they need to break. Because I've, I've seen the kind of people who do it, they're street gangs of teenagers. Of course. And they do it for fun. They don't feel the need to do it. Yeah. And they're not trying to meet some kind of deep financial need. And isn't that break? Isn't that the breakdown of society on the most fundamental level? Like I, I, I literally the breakdown on the most fundamental level where these kind of things are happening and people are going to try and pretend they feel sorry for them. It's it's absolutely insane. Well, yeah, the one thing the government should do if you're going to have a government is you should be able to just walk around a city and be unmolested. You're not going to get hit by a homeless person. And th to me, you should just take that for granted. But you let you go to San Francisco. You better watch your back during the daytime. People, there was um, Noe Valley is actually a quite rich area, a median household price one point five million dollars. Yep. Um, mother was walking with her kids, and a guy just came over and just smashed her over the head, dude. Yep. And Noe Valley, and that that isn't the kind of thing that happens there. But the flip side to that is, I I don't feel sorry for the people of San Francisco because. Yep. They're, this is the world that they're creating. Yep. And then, but then meanwhile, you know, they would, they're, they're going to listen to this podcast and look for hate speech on the podcast yep. while they're getting bricked in the head <laughs> by druggy degenerates. Yeah. Yeah. They're worried about yeah. talk. They're that, worried yeah. about speech. That's a great contrast. Very great. It's yeah. true. And it's, yeah. just, and, and, it's, it's, and it's not just San Francisco. London's exactly the same. They keep voting for the same stupid, stupid things. They, keep, they refuse to pass hard laws. Crime is going up thousands of percent a year. It's like 30 or 40 stabbings a day. And everyone's dying, and they're just sitting there going, oh, well, you know, maybe if we wait long enough. Like, what's going to happen? I'm, I'm a man who's always believed, and I think every man understands this, action over inaction. And, and I think it was General Patton who said, a good plan today is better than a perfect plan tomorrow. you got to do something, and you got to do something fast. Yeah. You're just sitting around talking about it and hoping for things to get better. Has never, I don't know, I don't know about you gentlemen, but every time I ran out of money in my bank and I thought I'm going to sit around and hope for something to come, it never really worked never out. Right. It never right. worked out. You know, it's like which is a way why crisis. Because um, we can segue a little bit into what you guys do. Because I know you guys. You know, we're having a socio political conversation, which is good, and I like to talk about that stuff too. But then I found that uh, that attracted a class of people, and by class I don't mean socioeconomic, because many of them were quite um, wealthy. Though who they only want to talk about problems, I think, is a way to not deal with their own lives yep. and, their, and their own problems. So they're like political addicts and yep. can't believe the world's falling apart. And it's like, well, I mean, actually, you're falling apart. You're, yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. You're, what, are you, what are you doing about your own life? And I know that you you do a lot of sort of, I don't know if mentorship is the right word, but yep. you, you, you are in a certain space trying to, to help people live better lives. So what's that look like? And yeah, what are you doing? absolutely. And I think you said the perfect thing there about themselves, people – they're, they're falling apart and they're worried about the outside world because that's the exact answer I give. People come to me and go, I'm really worried about the West. I'm worried about having kids. I'm worried about this. I'm like, look, okay, bro, do you have enough money to move? No. Okay, well, that's your, don't worry about voting for nothing. Don't worry about any sitting there reading every political article. Look after yourself first. You can't pour from an empty cup. The first thing you should be focused on 
is if you're really truly concerned about these problems is at least have enough money in the bank or enough assets or whatever it takes for you to say, you know what, I'm booking a flight. I'm going to Singapore. I'm going to chill in an Airbnb for the next three years. Worry about yourself first. And once, once you get that kind of mindset and that kind of attitude, politics becomes a hobby. It doesn't become your be all and end all. And that's how it should be. If you're looking at a politician, good or bad, to either improve your life or you think a politician is going to ruin your life, you've got the wrong mindset towards life in the first place. I mean, I'm a Trump fan, but has my life got any better under Trump? Really? No. I just enjoy the trolling. I mean, it makes me laugh. <laughs> right. You know, but like in general, like it's, it's kind of like a politician can only do so much. So my mentorship attitude is very, very much you're on your own. And, and I guess that maybe comes from the fight thing. I mean, you're in the ring on your own. No one's going to save you. You got but the best I, coach in the world. You're, you're there alone. You're getting hit. So I think a piece here that's interesting that maybe we're skipping over because, you know, there's a lot of people out there that don't necessarily know who you guys are, yep. is that both Tristan and Andrew um, actually have a mentorship program where you guys are literally mentoring young men yep. and, and uh, helping them better their lives, therefore bettering society. Well, we'll talk a little bit about what your program is. What is it? Yeah, so basically it's called The War Room, and it's absolutely everything from the ground up, whether it's your physical fitness, your finances, your attitude, and your relationships with women. Everything from the ground up, because my attitude towards life, and this is, once again, people are going to come along and say I'm wrong. I really believe you have to be a very well-versed person, and I believe you have to be successful in many different areas to be happy. You show me a rich guy who's terrible with women, he's unhappy. You show me a guy who's good with girls with no money, he's unhappy. You gotta have, you need to have the woman who loves you in a stable relationship. You need to have a good financial income. You gotta have good health. Nothing means anything if you're in hospital. So, no, nothing means so anything. You're, so it's, it's like teaching everything from the ground up because some of these guys are lacking everywhere. Some of them are lacking in one place. Sure. But you know, it's, it's just trying to explain that, you know, being the fitness bro and going to the gym every day and getting jacked, but not having a, a, a stable bank account and living with your mother at 33 is not, is not how life should be lived. You have to be able to do you're everything. You're obviously gonna, you're gonna suffer from depression. People went nuts when I said depression wasn't real. And I think people misunderstood me. My point is a depressed state of mind is real. The idea that a depression is a disease that comes from the sky and attacks you at random, I don't believe is real. I believe that people react to their surroundings. And I'm telling you now, I'm a strong-minded individual. If I was broke, working in Pizza Hut, without a girlfriend, living in a basement, all day video I, games. I, I'd be depressed. Yeah. Who wouldn't? Right. I mean, this is a natural human condition. And we've essentially, I mean worked in fast food restaurants and had no money when we were 18, 19. I know how it feels, so. Yeah. It's a depressing well, existence. Like, well, of course you're depressed. Well, one thing I, I think that's fascinating about the War Room versus some other uh, groups out there is that your organization, the War Room, it actually teaches a talent stack as you alluded to. Yep. It, it's not teaching you, hey, here's how you, you know, take some some protein powder and lift some weights, right? It's yep. actually teaching you there's a there's a money component. Yep. There's a networking component. I mean, yep. how do I walk into a room and actually not be a weirdo? Yeah. Right? Absolutely. And how do I relate with to people? How can I, you know, increase my romantic life? How can I mm -hmm. improve my financial situation? You guys have a whole talent stack within that group. Both Mike and I are, are members of the group, and so yeah. we've seen it. Uh, but the, the the stack that you're teaching in there is more than just one item. Yeah, you need everything. And are told, don't have pride in anything. Don't be arrogant in anything. You show me an arrogant dude who has his life all together, that's the kind of man I respect. I don't care if you come along and say, I'm, I'm the Don. I've got my wife. She loves me. I've got my children. She loves me. I know I can afford to feed them. I, I'm not, I don't need anyone but myself. That's the kind of person I respect. Sure. And so many people come to me, and they're like, oh, but you, know, you come across as arrogant. I said, my life's just fine. You know, and you, maybe you should be more arrogant and you won't take so much crap from people and you might get somewhere. Well, Let's try and, to install some pride and in And you're people, really, you, know? you are improving lives. I mean, we had this discussion before, uh, you know, about these socioeconomic conditions, but you're actually taking action. You and your brother are taking action and actually improving people's lives, therefore improving the world. Well, I mean, you have, we're, we're in Los Angeles right now. You have a group of people yep. down the street yep. at, at another uh, facility. Yep where you're doing training right now we're training them right now and I mean, we had 100 people in the transylvanian mountains you guys came out like it was it was yep. crazy how how fast it's come off and and michael uh so i'd like to hear cernovich's point of view on this but i really am a believer that if you're an able-bodied man in the west you can get your life together i don't care what how bad it starts i don't care like i have a sub story you have a sub story mike has a sub story none of us had a perfect start but if you're an able-bodied man with the right mindset there's no reason to live anything other than a nice good comfortable life you may not be a billionaire but you're going to have a, a wife who respects you. You're going to have children. You're going to have money in the bank, and everything's going to be fine. And, and that's my personal view. Yeah, the, all the information's there. That's why, in a way, I've 
I'm simultaneously empathetic to people's condition, but also very like intolerant where I'm just yeah. like, you're pathetic. Like I just don't even <laughs> want your energy near me. Like, yeah. what do you mean? You're, you're f physically able to walk. You're, you don't yep. have any like defects or whatever. And you're just, oh, I don't know. I can't do that. Or why do you do this? Or what if I do this? Or how do I do that? It's like, you can't pick up a book. Yeah. Right. You just, no. or you can now go to the internet. You can like game theory, any, any kind of thing out. And the, the thing I like about your approach is that you just don't allow people to ask questions. Like, no, you have to give me a situation. I went into this job. I applied. Yep. I've talked for half an hour. Here's the way the interview did. What went wrong? Yep. Versus, oh, how do I find a job? It's like, get out of here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Just get out of it's here. It's super results-based because yeah. I've yeah. kicked people out. I've had people who join. Absolutely. And they don't do what – they don't listen or they don't show – we say call it showing receipts. Show me something you're doing. So one week we'll say, you're going to do something impressive this week. I don't care what it is. You better show it. If you don't do it, then you get kicked out. And that's the reality. And that's the reality of life, man. That's the reality of life. You you can't be sitting around waiting for things to happen to you. Also, I think, especially in the West, a lot of people's problems are all in their mind. And I'm not saying that mental conditions aren't real, because absolutely some are. But I try and explain to people, look, if you, the only thing on the planet you have genuine control over is your state of mind. Like, you can't even control your health. You might get hit by lightning. You can't control other people. You can't control the weather. You can't control anything. The only thing you can affect in genuine real time is how you feel in your head. And so much, and, and so much of that's true because you know Scott Adams calls a mental presence. Other people talk about differently. And yeah, there's a difference. Like I've known people. This is why I don't have any um, patience for men who are like, blah, blah, blah. like my mom is bipolar. Like yep. I know what a real mental illness is. A real you one, don't yeah. have a mental illness. Yes. You're yep. just a pussy. Yep. You're just pathetic and afraid to take any kind of action. Yep. And these mental problems people have are, well, I'm afraid to go do that. Why? Because you're going to get rejected? Yep. Are you going to die? Yep. Are you going to go cry yourself to mm -hmm. sleep? So in their own mind, they have this fear of some consequence that may or may not even happen. And that is they're living in a mental prison or, uh, you know, you know, we had to bully, you know, uh, bull in here a little bit just to go to Romania because he was in a mental prison, never traveled internationally. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you have the money. Exactly. Just get on a fucking plane. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. just get get on a plane. Like because yep. Mike was like, well, what flight are you going to be on? I'm like, look, bro, I'm not your travel agent. Just yeah. get on a plane and do it. And then you realize, oh, that was amazing. Yeah, I'll I'm take, glad, I'll take credit I, I'm for glad that. I did that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take yeah. credit for bullying Mike. Yeah. And, and, uh, and there's so many people yeah. who just they don't. They, they literally live in prisons of their own making yeah. where there, there won't be any real consequence. Yeah, you might look stupid. Yeah, you might. I mean, you, you're, you've you looked stupid. You, uh, Everyone has. You have to. Everyone yeah. has. Right. And, and, the, and the worst thing is these prisons are propped up by people who who care about them. And I say care in, in, in if, if this is video. I say yeah. care in apostrophes because they think they care by reinforcing someone's negative behavior and attitudes. If someone comes to me and goes, oh, I get really shy and anxious, I'll say so. Right. Like, not, not, oh, okay, that must be horrible. No, so? Do it anyway. Yeah, but I'm shy. I don't care. I don't, no one cares. The whole world doesn't care. Nobody cares. You go. If you could drop dead tomorrow, the world wouldn't care. The sun's still going to rise. People are still going to go to work. So you're going to sit here and worry about speaking? Like, so many people are trying to be supportive, especially in the West. You have these family units and people around other people, and they think they're doing the right thing by being supportive, when really, you just need to be told, piss off. Yeah. You know, right. I don't care. I'm not and, interested in your well, excuse. Well, this is and what you're teaching in the war room. Yeah, I was going to say, that is one thing I will add about the war room. We are a movement of positivity. Me and Andrew are not archetypes that every man should try to strive to be. Um, however, you guys have seen my house. You've seen the cars I drive. Um, none of it's fake. You've seen the women that I date. Uh, I'm a very, very happy person. And I believe if you're a young man and you're 17 and you're playing video games, maybe masturbating too much on the internet, and you're not striving to live a life similar to mine, get a beautiful girlfriend, live in a nice house, drive a nice car, work a good job, make a good income. We are very, very happy people. And we tell people, what I think, what, what they need to hear rather than in reinforcing these negative stereotypes. It's, oh, you're oh you're sad. Well, you know, maybe you should see a psychiatrist. Maybe you should pop some pills. That's going to fix your sadness. No. Well, ha I mean, happiness yeah. is a super interesting, and, and shut me up if I'm talking too much, but happiness to me is a super interesting concept. Because when people come to me and say, I'm not happy, I say, why should you be happy? They're like, what do you mean? I was like, who told you you should be happy all the time without working for it? Happiness is at the top of a mountain somewhere. You ain't been anywhere. You haven't even climbed it. You haven't even got out of your house. Who tells you, only Western society has told you you should be happy permanently, without reason, all the time. That's not natural. No one, I don't think you should be happy. You're not happy, why? Well, you're, you're fat and you're lazy, you don't do shit. So, yeah, unless you're, you're not happy. Tristan, unless you're Tristan, who's 
or like my wife Shauna, they're blessed with some kind of happy gene. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Shauna is, is always happy. Yeah. Same yeah. with Tristan. And then, yes, and then people go, Tristan's the same thing. How do people go? Are you a happy person? I'm like, fuck no, I'm not happy, but I'm fulfilled. Like yep. I'm yeah. amped up. I get out of bed like ready to kill it. But yep. nobody who knows be like, oh yeah, Mikey's a real happy go, you know, go lucky guy. But the flip side is, it doesn't mean I'm depressed either. I've just, exactly. It's a, so people think they're like chasing a dragon. It's like, yeah. well, maybe you're not supposed to be happy. Yeah. Maybe you, you just want to do something that you think is like killing the game, and that's what what moves you. And yeah, and some people like like myself, and probably Mike will agree with me here. I can get happy, but I gotta achieve something big, and then it's temporary, and then I gotta do something else big. It's it's a huge motivator for me. Like it's the reason my life's amazing. But right. Tristan's happy about everything. He'll be like, guys, I I just I love that podcast. That was so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm like that was a good show. But like I need no. you know. I, need I, I, I I will slightly defend myself here. Eight years ago, when I was uh, driving a broken ass car and sleeping on my friend's couch, I was not happy all the time. You know, I, I've, I've I've reached a point and I've reached I've put a life together for myself where basically nothing can upset me. You know, some Twitter trolls come at me. That's the worst thing that could happen to me in a day. And you know, I laugh, I smile. I go out with my girlfriend, you know, I... You know. Which girlfriend, though? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, one, one of them. Yeah. Maybe, right. maybe two of them. Right. I'll, sit and have a, I'll sit and drink Japanese whiskey with you, and I think, well, the Twitter trolls, you know, they, they can sit and type away. I, nothing can phase me. Well, but I think that's what's interesting about both of you is that you're, you're, you guys are really friendly, nice guys, and you, and you get branded as being, yeah. you know, an asshole or something, True. but you're not. But I know Mike and I were going out to grab coffee in Romania, and we were trying to figure out how we were going to get there, and we were teasing that we were going to take um, Tristan Lamborghini and Mike and I like oh here's the key and the key was actually sitting on the counter yep. and he thought we he thought we legitimately took the car and he wasn't like calling us and freaking out and stuff he was like well you know, <laughs> have you know, fun. My, my, my rule is this I don't let anyone drive my car who couldn't afford Ford to buy to me a new yeah. one so, so Mr. Boland I would have written you a, a very big invoice with a, a few extra you know right. Romanian add-ons there right. for, the, for fees and for right. fees in my trouble no, but, but just, just to go back to the point and, and Mike said it perfectly just there that's a huge point on happiness when people come to me and say I'm not happy I say why should you be happy you and, and and we're all adults here the, this infantile mindset that we're all supposed to be like we were when we were three years old and, oh, something shiny, laugh all the time, run around in circles, ooh, a cardboard box. We're grown-ups and we have responsibilities and we have problems and we have pressure and you don't necessarily have to be happy to perform, especially if you're a man. Like, like women have this, uh, I, I, will, I guess to a degree, they're born lucky. Women have this mindset where they can, that people expect women to be happy. Women need to be happy. But as a man, you have a burden of performance. You, as a man, you shouldn't be waking up going, how do I get happy? As a man, you wake up and say, okay, how do I perform? You know, and, and happiness will come at the end of the performance anyway. But if your number one goal as a man, if your number one uh, mission in life is just to be happy, that's going to be an extremely vapious existence, and you're not going to be a man of substance. The men of substance out there are not necessarily happy people. You, you, Mike Tyson wasn't happy when he was smashing people's faces in. That's not how you get there. You don't get there being happy. It's not. It's, it's just a, a complete, the whole mindset, the whole idea that, oh, we all need to be happy all the time is the reason you have men on the streets taking drugs, looking for a quick fix because they don't want to do any real work to get any genuine fulfillment. So they end up shooting drugs, like we were talking about earlier, running around being fools. Yeah, and that's what ter happens. Terrified of pain. The, you, you don't, there's never been, maybe this is always the case, but... It just skipped a generation where the messaging should be like, oh, you're in pain? That's good. That's probably a sign you need to fix something. Absolutely. And you don't run from the pain like, well, you're in pain because you're broke. Okay, that's just your body's telling you to go work. Yep. To go work harder because you don't like being broke. Because I know some people, my dad, for example, he's what we would all consider poor. Happy is Tristan. Yep. He sits outside with his guitar and plays Christian songs and watches the squirrels eat. <laughs> thinks that he's the king of the mountain or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And that that's great for him. So he doesn't feel pain for not having money. But if somebody feels this pain, I always say lean into the pain. Yep. You know, it's it's one thing to have an, a physical injury like Tristan's shoulder or something where maybe it's a, a physiological thing. But if you have an emotional pain, you don't should, you should lean into that. Like, why, why, why am I feeling this? Well, you're feeling that because you feel that something is missing. And then you have to go find that thing that's missing. Depression is the ultimate motivation. Oh, so you're depressed. Okay, that, so, so you come along to me and you tell me you're depressed. I expect to see a huge list of what you're achieving per day. If you're unhappy with your life and you're depressed, I don't expect you to be popping pills and sitting and laying in bed. I expect you to give me a huge list of everything you're achieving per day. Depression's a fantastic motivation. You know, but people are told the opposite. No, you should feel depressed. That's wrong. You should be happy anyway. Take the pills. Stay home. Take some time off. Complete garbage. You're depressed? Okay, get up. Go for a run. Lift more weights. Make more money. Get a second job. 
get more girls. Like you, you can outrun depression. I said this to one guy who was coming to me. That's a great quote right there. You can outrun you depression. Can outrun you ain't got time depression. to be sad right. if you're getting where you need to get. You ain't got time for that. You can outrun it. If yes. you start working the jobs you need to do and you're training and you're seeing three or four different girls and you're trying to start your business on the side, you have no time to sit around moping. So right. outrun it. And before you know it, you'll wake up one day and you'll look at your life and go, wow. Well, you, you know, one thing that's interesting is many coaches, gurus, whatever you want to call them out there, they want you to come to where they are. And I think what's really unique about Tristan and about Andrew, both of you, is that you accept people for where they are and maybe where their lifestyle wants to be. You know, you, yeah. you mentioned this before. I don't care if a guy's married and has kids and yeah. lives in a nice house, if that's what he, where his happiness is. Yeah. Now, I can help him elevate that by helping him make more money, uh, getting in better physical fitness, yeah. maybe getting involved in a, a, a creative thing like chess or yeah. something. But but you meet people where they are and then help them elevate that that yes. lifestyle. You're not trying to say, hey, everyone should move to, to Bucharest Absolutely not. And, <laughs> and buy a Lamborghini and live in a, a, a no, big house. Here, my view on this is this. I, I really believe that every single man, every single one alive, every single man wants to feel respected. I believe if you give a man, if, if a man feels respected, he's happy. And if a man doesn't feel respected, either by his wife or society or whatever, he's miserable. I believe that respect is that important for men. This is why men would go to war and charge down a battlefield into near certain death and survive for a piece of ribbon. Respect. Men want to feel respected. This is why men want a fast car. It's why they want hot girls. It's why they want muscles. It's why they want money. It's all about feeling respected. So my goal is just to make, give people the ability to live a life that lets them feel respected. If you feel respected as a man, if people look at you and go, yeah, he's a man, you're a happy guy. It's only when people look at you and go, he's a bitch. That hurts. That yeah. hurts the dude. <laughs> no one wants to hear that. And that's well, the reality. That's also why I don't have a lot of patience for the people who obsess over anti uh, the feminist stuff because, sure, there's a lot of issues and everything else. But I think it's harder for a woman to be happier than it is for a man yeah. to be happy. Because a man can just go out and get it. And yep. moreover, you can be 50 years old as a man and still have access to all the things you wanted, assuming you you know yep. you have enough money and yes. everything else. Yep. Whereas a woman's 50, if she hasn't had any kids, she's going to have a, a much tougher time than a 50-year-old man. Instagram is Instagram's the number one cause of female depression in the Western world. I'm 100% sure of it. Any girl who's 29, I, have girl, I know girls who are 29, 30 years old, and they're still beautiful, but they'll scroll up and down, and they're and nearly in tears. They're not 22 anymore. Like literally Instagram is that powerful yeah. for these women and they live on it, you yeah. know? And, and so women, they got a ticking time clock, but as a man, and, and this is another great thing about being a man. You haven't got to be handsome. You ain't got to be pretty. If you're a successful dude and your mind's right, you can be, a, you can be an ogre and you're still going to be out there doing whatever you want to do and living your life, you know? So many, many examples of that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you haven't, you haven't got a, the whole women have one thing and this is what the feminist imperative is trying to destroy. But the reality and all of us know here is that the, a woman's importance is based on pri not primarily, but the one of the most important judging factors on a female is how she looks. Yeah. Whereas a man it's really, it's really not like that. If you're a big, successful, important dude, no one's going to say, Oh, well, his hair's crap. No one cares. Right, right. You know, well, so it's achievement. I even thought they that do, in fact, on Twitter. But. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they will on Twitter. But yeah, I've always thought it's one of the great unfairnesses of the world is that a 70 year old man, like there's pictures of George Soros, like partying or whatever, yeah. 80 years old, young, hot girls. I'm like, if you're a, a, a very successful 80 year old woman, like you can't pay for sex, you no. know, and if you think about it, it's kind of a sad thing. Right. Yep. But no, nobody. Joan Rivers, like, for example, said. You, you're always you always stay horny no matter how old you are. Just yeah. you can't find anybody to do it with. Yeah, you. yeah, yeah. Joan, if you're listening, thousand dollars an hour. <laughs> well, she's gone now, isn't she? <laughs> she's gone now. So you'll charge more than that, bro. Yeah, <laughs> the ghost. And but then men want to sit around and complain all day. I mean, these the whole like red pill sphere. And that's why I just avoid that whole subculture now because that's all they talk about. And yep. then because I've been around on the internet for a number of years, I'm like, okay, so you're still talking about this five years later. Yep. You, this is some crutch. Well, this is the thing. There's, there's two things to it. Life as a man, I believe, is, is like playing the video game on a harder difficulty. Greater reward, harder work for a greater reward. So if you're prepared to do the work, life as a top tier male is the best ex human experience. Even if you're a top tier female, even if you're like a supermodel and you've got 5 million followers on Instagram and you're on these boats or whatever, whatever, you're still getting dicked by one dude who, who half, who's bored of you, you know, like it was still, like still your only true fulfillment in life is going to be through your kids. And that's, that's all you can do as a woman, as a man. And you're living life as a top tier man. You can do anything. You can do anything that the humans have ever invented. You can go to space. You can buy a boat. You can have 20 supermodel girlfriends. You have kids all over the place. You can do whatever you want. So I believe life as a top tier man is the best thing. Right. I always tell people it's better to be an average woman than an average man. 
Yes. But if, if you're at the talking about the being the very pinnacle, yeah. then there's just no comparison. Absolutely. No. And, and, that, and, that's, and, and, that, no, and that's my point. Isn't that a fantastic motivator for men? Yeah. You know you can have the best possible version of reality if you get up off your ass more often. Oh yeah. yeah, but I'm tired. Well then, well then, what do you want me to do? Literally, and, it's, uh, and it's literally unbelievable too. Like I, because I watch your guys' stuff and I love it because I've lived enough life. I'm like, I actually can honestly say I'm not jealous of that. I'd rather sit home and read books or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But, because you've lived it. That's yeah. why. Yeah, yeah. I'll but, be the but, same because, you've done, yeah. because you've done it. Yeah, you don't have a midlife crisis. It's yeah. just like, I'm glad they're having fun, but that looks like an awful lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy yourselves. And then, you, but when you read these much older books, you realize that the way that you guys live would be unattainable in the history of the world to people like us born commoners. Yep. You yeah. would have to have been born into a royal family or, exactly. or like a Roman emperor or something. So you can live like a Roman emperor, but then guys want to bitch all day on the internet about how tough it is, it's so unfair, no. feminists are beating me down. So let's talk about that. Them. Well, let's talk about that feminist thing because you're completely right. The manosphere and the red pill and all this thing and all they talk about is feminists and feminism's ruined women and women aren't submissive and women aren't feminine, blah, blah. If you're talking to a feminist, if you're on a date with a feminist, you're a low-tier man. High-tier men are not dating these crazy, blue-haired, ugly, unattractive, disagreeable people. <laughs> like, <laughs> the fact you're even sitting there listening to her, the fact that this has even affected your life, I mean, yeah, is feminism a thing? Yeah. Are they messing with girls' brains? Yeah, sure. But if you're a real G, if you're a man, and your stuff's in order, and your life's in order, and you take a beautiful girl on a date, you're paying for the date, and she expects you to, and she wants to look pretty, and the gender roles are pretty much still basically mm -hmm. there. Like, the whole idea that it, it's impossible to find a girl now because of feminism, that, that just means you're too far down the pile, friend. That's, that's my view. Both of you gentlemen have been in my house uh, sitting, sharing whiskeys, drinks with me, cigars, uh, on multiple, multiple occasions. Uh, every time that's happened, there's been a beautiful girl there pouring our drinks, uh, cleaning up our cigar ash, emptying the ashtrays, uh, asking us if we want anything, getting ice. And these are girls who are 9 out of 10. These are the, the, the level of women, and I'm not going to... Uh, I am bragging. In fact, I am bragging. These are the level of women that, you know, millionaires date. I am a millionaire. Sports stars date. Um, and, and they're just waiting on us hand and foot. Why? You're, because I'm, I'm okay, not no, dating I'll tell you why. Crazy. I'll tell you why. Because a woman is a reflection of her man. That's why. Women are a reflection of your man. If you're, if you, if you're going through your life and every single woman you're with is ultra disagreeable, you, and, you, and you decide the problems with women and the problems with feminism and you don't see that the problems with you, well, then you're never going to have a happy, successful relationship. A woman is a reflection of her man. And that's the reality of, of the human condition. It's always been that way. If you see a woman who's looking after the kids and she looks after the house and she's a fantastic mother, that's a testament to the father, in my view. I'm like, her man's a G because she got her stuff right. Because if her man was a fool, she would be acting a fool. This is the reality. So guys come to me and go, every girl cheats on me. Every girl does this. Every girl does this. I hate girls. I'm like, bro, you need to hate yourself. You need to fix <laughs> something. Because my girls ain't cheating on me. So, you know, it's you have to take well, responsibility. Well, this goes back to some of the stuff that you guys teach. And, and maybe, you know, to kind of end this segment out is tell tell the, tell the folks listening to this, how how can they connect with you guys? Yeah, so. I, I mean, if this really resonates with you and you, you feel like you are that guy that, that needs to elevate your lifestyle, how do they connect? Yeah, so, so go, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say so. So Andrew, so Andrew obviously is going to say his stuff in, uh, about his website in a moment. But I, I'm I'm on Instagram, uh, uh, Talisman Tate, Talisman T A T E. Um, you can see how I live there. You can see the kind of stuff that I get up to. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, on Twitter, my account it, it tends to vanish and reappear at the moment. I'm at Lives Talisman. Uh, the Talisman was my fight name, hence the uh, usage in both my social media plugs. But uh, Andrew does have a, a series of courses on the website where he teaches stuff, and he's going to tell you about that right now. Yeah, yeah. So the War Room, you can access it at www.cobratate.com. But I'm going to tell you now, don't join if you're not serious about improving your life. Don't join. It's not like a gym membership where you join to feel better and not turn up. If, if you're going to do that, you're going to be very disappointed when I kick you out and keep your money. Yeah. Like, this is, this is the real deal. So only join if you're genuinely I've serious. I've seen him do that. No refunds. No refunds. Right. Yeah. And you could have my address in Romania. You want to come do something about it? We, we, we'll see you on the <laughs> we street. We can work it out. We'll right? work it out. We'll get old school. It's yeah. like, you know, that, this is what this is all about. It's about a group where you have to perform and you have to level up your life. There's there's no other way to stay inside of the group. So it's at www.cobra.com. And, and I do want to I, I, I do want to emphasize this. It's not a single program. This is a whole talent stack. Yep. that you're teaching and pushing people. And if you're not really in that mindset where you want to work on all those things, maybe you're just not ready for it yet. Yeah, if you don't, here's the truth. If you don't wake up, look in the mirror and think I'm the greatest man on earth, then you need to join the war room. Because that's my end goal of it. Mm -hmm. like, like I genuinely, like Mike said earlier about how the life we've constructed co coming from commoners is, is just the first time in history it can be done. I wake up and I look at myself and go, you know what? 
I've done the best I could have possibly done. Financially, physically, mentally, in every realm, I'm not the best maybe, but I've done the best I believe I could have possibly done. And I'm super proud of myself. And that's mm-hmm. how you should feel as a man. And that's a great way to have a fulfilled life. Is it, whatever that is for each person is different. But yeah. but to wake up in the morning and, and be and, proud of yourself. And, yes, it, exactly. You can have a completely different life to mine, but you need to be ultra proud of yourself as a man. And yeah. you should be proud of everything you've done and where you are. And you should be filled with pride because I believe prideful men are the ones who build beautiful societies. It's the prideful men that built the big, beautiful cathedrals. It's the prideful men who made the laws and the constitution. This is all based on pride. You can't have a whole bunch of shallow, weak, empty men doing anything of of merit on earth ever. It's never happened. Here's what that's what these guys are doing to improve life for everybody here. um, On that lives on this planet. You guys are doing your part and giving your all to improve life for everyone. Well, I, I'm, I had a bunch of people teach me and now that I've kind of retired from fighting and I just, you know, this was all motivated by Twitter. I kept getting so many people come at me and I was like, you know what? All right, I'm going to teach all you guys, but you have to be ready to do it. So we'll see. A lot of people have turned up so far. And if you're ready to join the program, I'll see you inside, but be ready for the struggle because like I said, happiness is at the top of the mountain. So thanks a lot guys. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you guys. Great talking to you guys. Thanks.